Welcome and thanks for joining us. My guest today is Corey Seville. He is the Deputy Chief Technology Officer for Compute and Senior Technical Advisor for the J9 Hosting and Compute at the Defense Information Systems Agency. Corey, great to have you with us. And your title has a lot of functionality in there. You've got a dual hat. Tell us about your role and how it fits into the bigger DISA strategy here in the cloud era. It's an interesting role. It's actually a dual-hatted capability. Of part of the uh, part of the position is at the agency level, whereas uh, the other part of the position is actually within our our J9 uh, hosting and compute uh, directorate. And so it's very similar roles. Uh, it's just at different focus levels. So uh, at the at the J9 level, I basically act as an integration point uh, between. Our, our J9 hosting and compute directorate and the rest of the agency from a, a cloud and computing perspective. And so I provide that cloud perspective, if you will, um, to the rest of the agency. And I also represent a lot of the uh, a lot of the cloud equities and compute equities at the CTO to CTO level. Um, when I talk with the agency CTO and, and even other uh, other agency CTOs. Um, at the external level, um, I basically work with other, you know, CTO level engineers and 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 leaders um, with different agencies to uh, advise them on their on their cloud portfolios, their migration strategies, um, and sort of their overall hosting and compute strategies to basically inform their their CIOs and senior leadership on you know cloud trends, on how they can make their capabilities more effective, how they can utilize cloud to their advantage. Um, and how we as an organization can help them achieve their goals uh, in their you know, cloud and migration strategies. Yeah, people yeah, tend people to think of to... cloud as a fixed and eternal thing based on what we started learning you know, 10, 15 years ago. What are some of the top trends in cloud from a technical standpoint? Uh, so the, the cloud world is moving towards uh, a lot of these microservice capabilities and distributed computing. So, uh, where the where the departments kind of operated uh, at, 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 in a long time at this you know monolithic level, right? Where it's kind of like we we put all of our stuff in one place. Um, you know, we host it from these big enterprise data centers, um, and we basically utilize uh, those facilities to provide capability to the department. Um, you know, cloud has has given us the ability to kind of shift out and distribute our capabilities, um, for, and for a lot of benefit, everything from being able to you know create resiliency and redundancy, um, you know, at a per application level, but also to provide, you know, capability to some of our OCONUS users um, and other, you know, in, you know, agency partners that may not be located within the continental US, um, but it gives them the capability to expand and, and get better service um, no matter where they are across the world. Sure, yeah, so that distributed idea is kind of profound because cloud was a central thing in people's minds initially but yet we finding a lot of virtue in, I guess, distributed computing. And uh, well, before we get onto some of the details of that, I wanted to ask you, by the way, about a signature program of DISA, the JWCC, the Joint Warfighter Cloud Capability. How's it coming? How are the take-ups going? What are some of the task orders? Success so far? Sure, yeah, it's, uh, it's, been, a, it's been a whirlwind since our, our award about a year ago. Um, and so basically what we're doing is our JVCC program office uh, is working with our uh, J9 hybrid cloud broker, which is our sort of entryway into uh, services that J9 provides. And those two together are working very closely with a lot of our customers, a lot of, of mission partners. Um, we have, we currently have uh, approximately 61 acquisition packages underway. Um, in our, our DAPS product, which is our sort of acquisitions uh, turbo tax, if you will, uh, for acquisitions to, to be able to create those packages and get them to the, to the proper contracting officers. Um, but we have, have 61 active uh, acquisitions in the pipeline. Uh, we've been able to work with a lot of different customers across the department. Um, so I, I believe it's really been hugely successful so far. Yeah, that's important because even though a lot of the ARM services have their own cloud programs for this or that effort, and there are a lot of them, and same thing with the non-ARM forces agencies of DOD, you're still finding and getting indications that the take-up for JWCC 
is going to be pretty strong. Absolutely. And and I think that one of the best things that this has created is it's created a very strong three-way partnership between the DISA, the cloud providers, and the department at large. And it really has helped us centralize, you know, where we believe the department's going, what we believe the demand from our de- from the department is on the CSPs, and how the CSPs can help us, um, you know, utilize the product efficiently, and and us being able to then provide them with, hey, these are the things that we're looking for from a warfighter perspective, um, and helping you know drive some of those business cases as well. So it's really created a very nice cohesive sort of partnership. Um, that's been really effective in in getting capabilities to the warfighter quicker. And a minute ago, you mentioned Oconus as a focus area, understandably, since the armed forces are everywhere in the world. And, you know, the knock on cloud to date has been, well, we may not have reached back to the cloud if we're forward deployed in the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean. So what are some of the cloud projects related to Oconus work that, that you have going? So... It's interesting, right? So, so the joint war, joint war fighting cloud capability is uh, is just an acquisition vehicle, right? It's a way to purchase uh, cloud, and and it doesn't necessarily by itself uh, solve the Oconus problem. The, the Oconus problem set is so large, um, and so what the one of the methodologies that we use to help with the Oconus problem set is JWCC does provide the tactical edge solutions. Um, from the cloud providers, right? So these are you know, connex sized modular data centers to a uh, backpack portable computing unit, right? That, that a customer could, could purchase. Um, we find that, that the tactical edge use case does support uh, a variety of warfighter use cases, but there's this, this middle ground, I think that we, we've, uh, you know, in the beginning of this, didn't have an answer for, which was, I can give you a tactical edge device, but what if, you want to be able to collaborate with other Oconus users in that same AOR. Um, and you want to kind of do it as more of an operational expense, right? You want to go to that buy by the drink model instead of having to put a large capital investment in uh, to utilize these cloud capabilities. You know, one of the strengths of cloud is that elastic uh, billing capability, right? Where I can spin up, spin down as necessary and, and kind of control my cost in that realm. And so uh, one of the projects that we're working on is an effort to extend both our private cloud and public cloud capabilities into the Oconus AORs. And so on the private cloud side, our, our private cloud uh, pr- private cloud uh, product called Stratus, um, we're actually implementing iterations of that product out in uh, Oconus, Oconus locations today. And so we actually have uh, our private cloud solution deployed out to Hawaii right now and are you know, we're looking at other sites for deployment And then on the public cloud side, we have something called our Joint Operational Edge Project, uh, which is a partnered project between DISA and the DOD CIO um, to push public cloud capabilities to the Oconus user community. And we actually have uh, two instances, well, I'll say one and a half instances of this out there today. Uh, We have a deployed instance in Hawaii right now, and we're actually pushing a, a new instance out to Japan uh, it's currently in development, hasn't been finalized just yet, um, but we have our, our pilot up and running in Hawaii, and we have a variety of different users, a uh, variety of different applications on that uh, today, uh, where we're working with them to deploy some of these cloud capabilities out there and really kind of kick the tires, if you will, on cloud at scale in the Oconus AORs. And these capabilities, these projects are coming from the commercial cloud providers themselves. Joint Operational Edge is, yes. Uh, so Joint Operational Edge, uh, right now our pilot is with AWS and we have deployed AWS Outpost, which is their uh, you know, enterprise grade, uh, multi-tenanted commercial cloud solution um, that we basically can put in our facilities. So one of the powers has been that DISA has what uh, a lot of the CSPs haven't been able to get, which is DOD authorized, you know, DOD level uh, facilities Oconus, right? The the data sovereignty problem set um, mm-hmm. where we have to own the data, be able to have the data, you know, exempt from, you know, local uh, local issues um, it requires it to be inside of our premise. And so what we've done is basically partnered with the CSPs to say, you have the, the cloud capabilities, we have the facilities, why don't we work on a project together 
uh, to extend those reaches into those Oconus locations. And so, uh, yeah, right now the, the Joint Operational Edge project is using AWS. Uh, we are quickly looking at bringing the rest of the cloud providers into this as well um, on the JWCC contract. So we're working with all the cloud providers uh, that are on contract to be able to get their enterprise grade deployable solutions and be able to put them in our facilities and, and have them there for consumption. Uh, the private cloud side is actually our uh, DISA's private cloud solution. So it is one that we own, we operate and, and engineer. Um, and so we think there's a really good partnership between the public and private cloud uh, environments that we have. And our goal in J9 has always been to create, to be a hybrid cloud provider. Um, because that is what we're hearing from the department as one of the largest demands. You know, the public cloud has use cases that are perfect for it. Private cloud has use cases perfect for it. And the warfighter really needs both of those to be able to work in tandem to get the largest uh, distribution and resiliency of applications that they that they are looking for. In some ways, it sounds like a reversal of the old my hardware in your cage model, where you are the cage and the cloud service providers are providing the hardware. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So that, that's, well, you know, brave new world we're living in, I guess. <laughs> uh, but I guess it's also important to realize that almost no scale enterprise gets away from having some hardware somewhere. Right. Absolutely. The cloud era. Talk about Olympus for a moment. This is the latest new project. So Olympus is a, a project that we currently have under development, and it focuses on providing what I call the, the common services. And so I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, in our data centers today, in our, in our private cloud provider, um, when, you, when you deploy an application, you can spin up your application on demand, um, you know, get your, get your uh, application configured. And a lot of the things that you need um, to stand up an environment, but that aren't specifically focused to your application, uh, are there waiting for you? So these are things like name resolution, like DNS capabilities, you know, certificates, um, you know, network time, all of these things that are often overlooked in application deployment, but they're crucial to getting an application off the ground. They're there for you. They're ready to go, as well as the integration into the network, the enterprise network, the boundary protection, and all those things. They're there for you ready to go. And what we realized is we have that in our private cloud side, but when a customer goes and they purchase a JWCC task order and they uh, you know, get their cloud account, um, I always liken it to the, the quintessential uh, image of a writer sitting in front of their computer and they pulled up their uh, you know, Word document and they see the blinking cursor and that empty page and how intimidating that can be right? to start those first couple words on paper. Um, we, we sell it on the public cloud side and we said, well, how in the world can we expect all mission partners across the across our ecosystem to be able to just walk out there and be, immediately become cloud experts? Um, and so Olympus is our attempt to give the same head start that we do to our private cloud customers to our public cloud customers. And so our, our minimally viable product or our MVP for, for our Olympus project focuses on two core competencies, one being enterprise network connectivity and boundary protection, and the other focusing on common services. And the methodology really is to create a, a managed platform um, where the customers can just come in and drop their apps. And we, we remove the burden or share the burden of bringing all of those common services up and operational uh, off of the customer, right? So we don't let you go out there, you know, out in the cold on your own. Uh, we, we're giving you a, an ability to get started quicker and really lowering the barrier for entry for getting started in cloud. The, the thing I like about Olympus and, and the thought process is we aren't the first people to do this. This is a pretty proven capability, and a lot of the services actually have this capability out there today. So everything like Cloud One uh, from the Air Force, you have Navy with Flank Speed, you have Army with ECMA. Like these products and capabilities, this this idea of this managed platform isn't new. Um, and the reason we kind of undertook this is because we saw that you know Cloud One was really built with with Air Force focus in mind, right? You know, Navy was very focused on the flying speed user, ECMO is very focused on the Army user. And what we did is designed Olympus to 
catch the customers that may have fallen through the cracks. And sometimes it's, it's really difficult for a non service component to be able to use another service components system, right? From a business model perspective, from a finance perspective, it makes it really difficult to get in. And so what we're trying to do is create an organizational agnostic platform for some of those customers that may not be able to use those capabilities or may have specific use sets that maybe don't fit well into those capabilities to give them a place to go to get them started um, as they're really getting their cloud journey off the ground. And the Olympus products, where are they hosted? They'll be hosted in all the the four CSPs, um, the JWCC CSPs. So right now, uh, our pilot is in Azure, um, but as customer demand operates, we will you know we'll expand into different CSPs. And that, that's one thing you'll find with a lot of J9 capabilities, but especially with Olympus, these are iteratively designed products with a very strong customer feedback loop. And so when we develop any of our capabilities, we really we're kind of trying to get away from that five-year plan, 10-year plan. You know, we know exactly where we're going to go and nothing can, can can force us to deviate, right? We create a North Star. We know where we want to go. And then what we do is we iterate the product based on customer demand. I mean, DISA being, you know, a lot of working capital and, and J9 specifically being a lot of working capital mm-hmm. fund, we operate very much like industry does. And the most important thing to us is our customer, the warfighter, they know their mission better than we do. So for us to prescribe where we're going to go doesn't make sense if our goal is to support the warfighter. And you mentioned there is uh, one of the products, one of the services under Olympus is the network connectivity. I wanted to ask you about the network connectivity in the larger sense of DISA and cloud activities. We were talking about Oconus and you can deploy cloud-like structures that travel and, you know, take them where you need to go. But the connectivity to the mothership, that is network connectivity carriers, how do you handle that for the Oconus work or the distant areas or people that may not have adequate bandwidth? That gets back to kind of one of the founding ideas of DISO, which was originally buying telephone lines, you know, for, for the military. So it's a it's a multi-vectored problem set for us. Um, with us being hosting and compute, there there is a network uh, requirement on you know a lot of our systems and capabilities, and we always have to have that in account, you know, take that into account when we're deploying new capabilities. Um, but this actually has a separate section that is focused specifically on delivering transport and delivering the uh, you know the 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 backbone of the network, if you will, um, and that's our our PEO transport division, um, and we actually have a extremely strong relationship uh, between J9 and our our RPO Transport. um, And their technical director and myself stay very connected. And we basically sit together and show roadmaps, right? So my roadmap is going this way. Your roadmap is going that way. Where can we meet and take advantage of some of the resiliency that each of us is building in um, to make our products operate better together? Um, the, the other piece of that is the other vector of how we deal with that problem set is providing the optionality to the customer. And this goes back to, you know, the customer knows their mission better than we do. Um, a lot of times when we're providing a service or capability, we have to balance the tactical use case and the enterprise use case. And just as being a service provider, right, we tend to, to fall in that enterprise use case because we have to provide you know, that agnostic service to the entirety of the department. Um, and so when we were really looking at our portfolio and trying to understand how we were going to provide services, one of the design tenants and one of the tenants of our entire organization has been optionality. And so when I have an Oconus user who's trying to build out a capability, we're going to provide them with a menu option, right? And say, these are the capabilities that are available to you and basically give them the option of, hey, I want to use this cloud capability. And I also want to use this private cloud capability. And I also want to use uh, what we call our data center as a service feature, which is where they can go back to the more traditional model of, you know, host a host workload in my facilities, right? Um, and the uh, the optionality gives the customer the ability to create their own meal, if you will. Um, you know, it, it's you know, go to a pizza shop and you're looking at the different toppings you can get, and you can really make that meal your own. We want the customer to be able to make their computing capability their own. 
And so let them decide, do they want a combination of tactical edge, operational edge, and maybe some data center as a service to give them the ultimate level of resilience? Um, or do they want to go strictly tactical edge and just maintain that sort of you know, local ownership of that computing capability? Um, and it really does come down to, as we've pulled the thread on this many times, it always comes down to each application, each use case is wildly different. Mm -hmm. And so the last thing we want to do is create a rigid service that only meets a particular type of use case and everybody else is kind of out in the cold on their own. We want to provide them the option to pick and choose the way that they want their system to look. And if they're unsure or they, you know, they want to get some advice or maybe, hey, I've got this application, how can I figure out how to do that? Um, we have an entire uh, professional services group that can help them walk that walk that road together, right? And so, at the end of the day, to to solve that problem and honestly a lot of problems that that J9 deals with, our goal is to be a partner with, them, right? So as a we don't view it as a, a customer vendor relationship or a customer uh, you know product relationship. We really do view it as a partnership. So we want to be involved in the process of working with that customer to really develop, understand their mission, understand their use cases, and provide them with a suite of services and capabilities that they can best use to get their mission done. And I wanted to ask you too, uh, the original premise of cloud, well, there were a few of them. One of them was elasticity. And to what extent do people actually use cloud for its elastic capabilities? changing workloads, changing numbers of users, whatever the case might be, cyclical demand for a given application. Is that part of the equation in people's thinking generally? Absolutely. And, and I think what you'll find is the, the utilization of it is trending upward. Um, you know, in the beginning, when we were looking at the cloud migrations and, and you know, we were sort of that, that infancy of, hey, I'm going to pick up my stuff and I'm going to move it to cloud. Uh, the lift and shift model was pretty heavily used. Um, you know, it was, I pick up everything in my data center, I image it all, and I ship it as is, exactly as is, up into the commercial cloud environment. And what immediately was apparent is that the cost was not different. In fact, it may have been more than what I was paying to maintain uh, my, my on-premise workload. And, and the reason for that is because that's how those cloud environments are designed. They are designed assuming that you're going to take advantage of Elastic, you know, scale capabilities, serverless compute capabilities, you know, that hyperscale support in things like containerization and others um, that help drive those costs down. And so when the when the department kind of started undertaking this realm, there was a lot of that. Hey, why are why are these costs so different? This doesn't make any sense. But I think people are starting to realize that taking advantage of elastic scale, taking advantage of serverless capabilities that's how you're going to save that money. And it's also how you're going to be able to effectively distribute your application. So what I think you'll find, um, and, and this is just you know, a singular opinion, but I think you'll find as the app refactor trend starts to increase, the adoption of elastic scale will also increase because some applications aren't really designed to be elastically scaled, right? They are, they're, hard, they're hard systems with hard configurations that are required uh, to, you know, hey, if you want to expand this out, you got to stand up a brand new server, configure it, adopt it, get all these things done. Um, and so there is an app refactor model that has to take place in order to be, for you to effectively take advantage of elastic scale. And so I, I think as you see, I think those two trends will continue to match each other uh, as the department continues its journey into cloud and continues its journey into app modernization. That means that you have to work with agencies and they have to work with you to make sure they understand the dynamics of a given application so that they can plan ultimately a service level agreement that is cogent for what it is they're trying to do with that workload. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's why, you know, with, with J9, we're really pushing for partnerships, right? We, we want to be involved throughout the process and it really just isn't a, okay, you bought our product, have a nice day. No, it's, we want to understand where you're going, right? Be part of your journey and, and really help you through that. Journey. By the way, how do the clouds play with one another? That was an issue early on, but I just hear relentless demands, comments from the government side that they really want to be cloud agnostic to the extent possible. And clouds have flavors, but on the other hand, there's a lot of plain vanilla 
I think, is the expectation people have. Yeah, and I think you'll find, you know, every cloud service provider has proprietary technology, proprietary storage mediums, proprietary APIs, right? That That's how they do business. And so I, I think the expectation that I'll be able to pick this piece of one cloud and this piece of another cloud and jam them together, I think is a little bit of a fallacy, right? And and I think the the methodology for what the department is looking for, that cloud agnostic, multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, I get to pick up an app and move it wherever I want. And it could be in this cloud today and this cloud tomorrow or be in both at the same time, um, really relies on that app rationalization, that app modernization framework. Um, you know, when you utilize things like, you know, the CNCF, uh, you know, container methodologies, right? Every provider will support a CNCF container. Mm -hmm. um, when you're building out storage, right? As long as you're following those industry best practices, those industry standards, those things are supported across the different cloud providers. So I don't think it's something that we as the government can step into a cloud service provider and say, no, you must work with these systems. I think it's a, a shared responsibility that they are working to, you know, as, as different businesses to work together and understand how their apps can integrate based upon the use cases that we're providing. But there is an onus on us as the federal government to be able to say, we are going to follow industry best practice, industry standards when we develop applications and develop capabilities so that we can easily tie in to the rest of the frameworks that are provided by these providers. And I want to switch topics here a, little, a minute and talk about sec dev ops in the cloud. We've sort of had an operational focus to, the, I think, the discussion to this point, but you know, software development was really the early, back when, you know, people bought accounts willy-nilly until somebody realized how many accounts were on federal credit cards for development environments. But what is going on there? And I believe there's a project called Vulcan. That one doesn't end in U.S. to uh, to take care of that end of things. Tell us what's going on. Yeah, the... Uh... It's really it's really heartwarming for me to see the uh, the prevalence of DevSecOps continue to to increase in the department. Um, you know, DevSecOps, you're right. You, the, the operational focus conversation uh, there there's this mindset that it switches to development when you start when you start talking about DevSecOps. But really, DevSecOps is that cultural movement to say no, no, no. They're the same conversation. Right? You have to understand that the software development practices are starting to be integrated into operations all across the IT environment. And so uh, it, it's really nice to see that proliferation occur. Um, Vulkan uh, is a product that we created. It is a, a DevSecOps tool suite, we like to call it. Uh, today, it, it uh, contains a code repository uh, and our software project management capabilities, which is our Atlassian suite, you know, Jira, Confluence, all the tools that are required for you to uh, manage software projects, and then document those software projects. And when we developed this capability, the, the goal was to provide customers with the ability to consume these DevSecOps cap capabilities in a you know, pay-by-the-seat, pay-by-the-drink model, uh, that operational expense model, as opposed to having to stand up their own repositories, their own software uh, project management capabilities, integrate them together, uh, deploy, maintain, operate, and secure a code repository and all these other capabilities, and then start their DevSecOps projects. Um, it, it really was to, again, you'll hear uh, a lot when I talk, and, and a lot of the J9 design tenants are all built around lowering the barrier for entry. Um, and so the, the Vulkan capability was meant to lower, is meant to lower the barrier for entry uh, for customers that either want to you know, start in the world of, Dev, of DevSecOps uh, or holistically lift and shift their DevSecOps processes from something they built on their own platforms to a more, uh, you know, OpEx model. Um, what we're really trying to do with lowering that barrier for entry is also we want to increase collaboration. And so when, in order to get collaboration, you have to have centralization. And really, there, there's two main ways we, you know, the, that we have historically promoted centralization. One is through mandate. The other is through uh, incentivization. And uh, mandates just don't tend to stick, right? Again, the mission owners know their missions better than we do. Why would we want to mandate something and say, thou shalt use X, when we don't know if it even works for their mission? 
And so what we want to do is incentivize use. And the way we incentivize use is through ease of access. Um, and so when we built the Vulcan platform, we built from a technical, from a connectivity, and from a finance and licensing perspective, we built a project that was focused around lowering the barrier for entry. And so our Vulcan platform is, you know, for example, it's available on our private, you know, network, our, our NipperNet, right, or our unsecured pri or our unclassified private network, uh, but it's also available on internet. Um, it's integrated into our federated identity management system. So you don't have to have three different accounts to get into something else, you know, another password to remember um, or another, you know, certificate or another authentication mechanism. It's integrated into that holistic federated identity management system. And from a licensing and, and cost perspective, it we built it based on transparent and simple pricing. This is there isn't a confusing menu option of different levels and tiers and all this kind of stuff. It's do you want uh, the code repository, you can have the code repository. Do you want the, the software management suite? You can get the software management suite. Do you want both? You can have both, but you as a customer get to pick. And so we really view the product as a low risk method for anyone in the department to either start their DevSecOps journey or offload the, the nuanced work of DevSecOps uh, uh, to us and let them just focus on doing their DevSecOps capability, um, you know, doing their DevSecOps projects and running their mission as they see fit. And getting back to that idea of the code repositories and so forth, is there a discovery mechanism or a directory? Because if you have all these components doing Sec DevOps ops, there could be a lot of opportunity for, hey, someone already developed that block of code why don't I need to do it? I'll just use theirs. It's all in the family. I think we're as the depart as a department, we are we are working towards that model. Um, does it exist today? I, I don't necessarily believe so. Um, but we actually, for example, uh, on the Balkan side, we have very good uh, relationships with Platform One. We have very good relationships with Army Software Factory. Uh, you know, and what I what I think it's promoting is that the department is not trying to do this in silos. Um, you know. DOD CIO and others have really looked at this and said, look, you guys can't develop in, in silos. You have to work together as, as programs uh, to be able to foster that, that collaborative relationship. I think the, the, all the pieces are in place for us to start going towards that road of, you know, I don't think there's ever going to be a one repository to rule them all. It's just, it's too large of a problem. And again, you know, services tend to have specific needs that force them to do things a certain way. But there's no reason that just because there isn't one repository to rule them all doesn't mean that we can't collaborate between repositories, you know, synchronize code, push code, or even have just something as simple as wedges that say, hey, if you're looking for this particular piece, it's over here um, as a starting point uh, to, to get us to that model. So I don't think it's there today, but I think we are on the cusp of, of getting there because I believe that we collectively as the sort of DevSecOps community in the department are starting to see that that really is the way we have to go uh, to create that true DevSecOps collaboration and adopt that DevSecOps culture at large. And we really should talk about artificial intelligence, which is coming to every place pretty much there is. And it does require extensive computing resource, especially the GPU, you know, has been widely reported. How are how are you responding? What's your plan? What's your thinking about how you're going to deal with cloud services in the artificial intelligence era? Uh, the the artificial intelligence conversation is is definitely booming right now. I mean, I, I think every conference I've been to uh, and every major you know technologist uh, talks I've ever heard in the last couple of years, uh, if I don't hear AI, I, I feel like I haven't the conference isn't over yet. Um, I feel like it's always coming. Um, and so yeah, it's it's taken the, the industry by storm. Um, it's definitely taken the department by storm. Um, and I think there's we're, we're in that discovery phase right now as a, as a department. Um, I, I think we're getting a better handle on understanding that there are different types of AI. Um, there are different deployment types and deployment cases for AI. Um, where whether it's just a, a, a large language model that you're operating to, it's embedded in another application or, you know, a, a, a cloud provider service is using AI on the back end to provide you the data that you're seeing. Um, and so we're, we're starting to 
uh, you know, pull apart the problem set and, and start, I, I believe, starting to attack it in, in multiple facets. Um, I don't think we have a holistic approach just yet. Um, but what we're doing, I can tell you from the J9 side, is we're very much tracking um, AI usage within the agency and, and the department at large. And we're actually working with another part of, of DISA, which is the Emerging Technologies Group, uh, who is really heading some of the AI development and AI research uh, for the agency. Uh, we're staying very connected with them. And what our goal is to do is to hear requirements from them, hear kind of what their thoughts are on how, from an agency perspective, they want to you know, wrangle this AI problem set. And then what we'd like to do is be the provider for some of their computing capabilities going forward, whether that's you know, large scale GPU deployment, or maybe there's a cloud service uh, provider framework that we can you know, front, or you know, maybe there's additional things we need on, to get on the JWCC contract. You know, there, all the methodologies we could use to provide those capabilities to the department. I think J9 is is a both a consumer and a and a uh, you know supplier essentially of of capabilities for AI. Uh, but the use cases right now are so broad, we don't want to take a, a a tactical approach to going after them. And really, we want to find an enterprise approach to getting the answer right um, on the on the AI journey. And I just wanted to find out how you came to this role. Give us a little sense of your own history here in the cloud environment. Uh, so I actually I actually started on the network side. Um, I was a network engineer by trade. Uh, spent a lot of time working in you know large scale, uh, wide area networks. Uh, spent a little bit of time in the banking industry. Um, spent a little time as a consultant, uh, and then spent a decent amount of time as a DoD contractor before I went uh, into the civilian world. And um, I went into the civilian world in uh, what formerly was the cloud computing program office out of, of DoD CIO. Um, and so that organization really gave me a my first large scale look at how I'm how cloud is going to impact the department. Um, and that organization was the was the organization that had the precursor to JWCC or the Jedi contract, um, but also it's well known for Jedi, but maybe not so well known for some of the other things that uh, it did. A couple of those are Global Directory, the CDR uh, deployment, and so you know, coming from a coming from a very network, you know, siloed, network centric environment, uh, it was a little bit of a whirlwind uh, jumping into the into the cloud world. But uh, after doing that, you start to see the parallels. You start to see the areas where where cloud can really benefit us, um, and so. When uh, the CCPO merged into DISA, I think it brought two very powerful organizations together. One focused on cloud deployment, cloud capabilities, and, and sort of that DevSecOps model. And the other organization focused on large-scale enterprise infrastructure hosting, you know, data center proliferation, enterprise network connectivity. And it really was a match made in heaven. I mean, it was a, it gave us the capability to push the cloud deployment model across all of our hosting capabilities, but also show the true power of when cloud and enterprise hosting work together, you really create a force to be reckoned with. Yeah. And since you do come from the network side, I just wanted to return to that notion of you work closely with the networking side of DISA, which is separate from the cloud. Are you jointly exploring some of the new emerging sources of bandwidth and connectivity low Earth's orbit satellites, swarms of satellites, all of these commercial capabilities, the armed services are looking at them. And you must be looking at them also in the context of that worldwide connectivity, the the uh, reach out from austere environments that is so much a missing piece here in many cases for the total you know, worldwide DOD network. Absolutely. And I think, uh... At a, at a high level, I, I can say, you know, we are looking at, you know, the, the PLEO capabilities. We're looking at the, you know, everything that we could use to better deliver uh, networking capabilities to the warfighter. We are very much connected with our RPO transport partners. Um, and I think what, what we do is, you know, when they develop a new capability or a new, uh, you know, transport model, we immediately look at, well, how can we integrate that into our product set? And vice versa, when we deploy a new capability or a new uh, region, for example, we go back to 
transport and say, hey, is there is there a world where you could land transport with us so that we have compute and transport together? I mean, when you look at a lot of the hyperscalers and you look at a lot of the, the what I'll call like the hyper co-location uh, providers, the idea of edge compute becomes a little bit different than like the tactical edge model. It actually becomes compute at the edge of the network. Um, and so, you know, tying in computing capabilities with network transport um, is is really becoming a, a, a very large you know, force multiplier for a lot of what we do. And so we we tend to work with our, our partners at PO Transport and basically say, hey, is there a way that we can marry the transport and the compute uh, products that we're putting together um, in these different regions to be able to provide that, you know, uh, information highway, if you will, um, sure. and, and capabilities highway. Yeah, you mentioned computing at the edge of the network. Maybe it's more accurate to say it's computing in a network with no edge. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the edge model is becoming a, a little more opaque as you start to push these capabilities further and further out. All right. Well, listen, you've given us a lot to think about, and I want to thank today's guest. Corey Seville is Deputy Chief Technology Officer for Compute and Senior Technical Advisor for the J9 Hosting and Compute, all at the Defense Information Systems Agency. Great having you with us. Thank you for having me. Really enjoyed the conversation. I'm Federal Drive host Tom Temin. You're watching Federal News Network. Let's go back to the studio now for more on the DOD Cloud Exchange.